Hey everybody, welcome to uh, the second video for chapter six. And in this one, we're going to be talking about civilizations of South America. So at the beginning of this chapter, we learned that the Americas are a pretty big region, right? You know, that being said, you only had civilization in Central and South America. We already learned about the Central American civilizations, namely the Maya and the Aztec. In this video, we're going to learn about civilization in South America. Now, there were several different civilizations over the centuries, but we're only going to be discussing one. By far the most dominant South American civilization were the Inca. Incan civilization were located in the Andes mountain range. The Andes are a large mountain range that runs along the western part of South America. Right, so it goes all the way up here for where Central America kind of meets in with South America. And it goes through a number of different countries. It goes through Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile. Chile is this narrow little one along the Pacific coast here. Uh, Bolivia. Okay, that's this one here. And then even a little bit into Argentina here as well. And right, so it's a pretty big mountain range. And the Inca developed numerous techniques to thrive in a mountain environment, which we'll uh, be discussing later in the video. Now, the Inca built a thriving empire under the rule of this guy, one of my favorite names to say, Pachacuti Inca Yupanqui. Uh, he was a pretty powerful warrior and leader. And in 1438, he proclaimed himself to be Sapa Inca. Sapa Inca is just a term for emperor. So as you can say from a gold statue of him, he was a pretty important guy. And as Sapa Inca, he set out on a path of conquest that expanded the size of the empire. So you see here at its height in the late 1400s, the Incan empire was most of the mountain range that I just went over here. All right, so it went over a good chunk of the Pacific coast of South America. Now, conquered people were forced to enlist in his army, uh, thereby continuing the conquest. He would use the conquered people to go out and conquer more people. Now, Pachacuti established a standard of absolute rule for the emperors. Emperors were believed to be the son of the sun. They believed that they were descended from the sun god. Again, you see a gold statue of somebody. It's going to show that they're pretty important. And this gave them divine heritage and powers. You know, this is another example of divine rule, something leaders have done in many societies to keep control over the people. And the Sapa Inca owned all property. He literally owned everything. The people themselves did not have ownership rights to anything. The emperor was therefore responsible for keeping the people fed and working. You know, in some ways, it was kind of like a form of communism where private ownership does not exist and the government regulates everything. All right, let's move on now to discuss Inca society. So we already established that the Inca Empire was an absolute monarchy with complete control held by the emperor. This was not to say, though, that the emperor never delegated or gave out responsibility to others. Nobles were people who were given responsibility to run the different parts of its empire. So the provinces, a province is kind of just like, you know, think of it almost how like our country is broken up into states, you know, um, uh, actually up in Canada, right? You know, they, uh, they have provinces. So it's just a way that a nation or an empire can be divided up. And these nobles were high ranking government officials and they handled all the day to day operations, such as collecting taxes and making sure laws were being upheld. The government strictly controlled the lives of the people. Each village was run by a lesser government official that kept track of everything. As part of this effort to keep tight control, the government, the government made sure that everybody spoke the same language and practiced the same religion. So a significant difference from the Romans, right? The Romans allowed conquered people to keep their customs and religions. The Inca made everyone they conquered adopt Incan customs, whether they wanted to or not. So working for the government gave you top status. Also, there was practically no merchant class. The reason for this was that trade was not a big part of Incan society. The reason for this is because it was practically impossible for anyone to accumulate wealth through trade since all property was technically owned by the emperor. So there wasn't really any point in buying or selling goods since you didn't really own it. All wealth went back to the emperor. Now, like in all classless societies, the majority of people in Incan uh, society were farmers. I'll talk more about Incan farming in a little bit. One last thing to discuss about Incan society was the impressive road network that they developed. Roads were always an important aspect of major civilizations, whether it was Persia, China, Rome. A difference between Incan roads and road networks of other civilizations, though, was the purpose for which the roads were used. As I just said, trade wasn't a big thing in Incan society, so roads weren't really used to facilitate travel for trade. They were used primarily to unite the empire. 
An effective travel network can be very helpful in uniting a large area. It allows armies to move quickly in order to maintain order and control. It also allows government messengers to move quickly. This helped the emperor keep tabs on all heirs of the empire. Remember, the, uh, the government wanted to know what everybody was doing at all times. They wanted to keep that tight control. If there was a problem in one of the provinces, word could be sent quickly to the capital along the many roads. If such a problem grew into rebellion, troops could be sent to put it down. Overall, the Inca built over 14,000 miles of roads. You see, it kind of works almost like a system of blood vessels, it looks like, of veins and arteries working its way down the Pacific coast. Now, building this was an impressive feat considering the Inca lived in the mountains. Roads had to be carved into the side of, of some pretty steep slopes. Um, and you see how some of these roads, excuse me, are still in existence today. They also had to build hundreds of bridges uh, over ravines and canyons, and most of these bridges were rope bridges. So you were not going to get me to cross one of those things, but they were effective of allowing people to navigate through some pretty treacherous terrains. Now, we'll finish up our discussion of the Inca by talking about Incan culture. Uh, the Inca had a complex religion, and like all other Native American religions, it was polytheistic. They worshipped a bunch of gods, but the sun god was the most important, their sun god Inti. You know, remember that the emperor claimed to be related to the sun god, so it made sense uh, to make a big deal about him. And they would celebrate this god with huge festivals and elaborate ceremonies and, and things like that. The Inca also had impressive achievements in science and learning. This was especially true for metalworking. The Inca were some of the most skilled metalworkers in the Americas. They learned how to blend and shape a variety of metals into elaborate sculptures, whether it was for their sun god there or llamas. Uh, they also had impressive medical advances, including surgery on the human skull. You know, you see these pictures here. These are not from being bashed in. They would actually carve out sections of the skull in order to alleviate pressure. Now, in order to do this, you have to be pretty skilled with what's called antiseptics and anesthesia. An antiseptic is something that cleans or disinfects the wound, while anesthesia puts you unconscious for surgery. You definitely do not want to be awake when someone's carving out a piece of your skull. Now, I mentioned back in the beginning of the video that the Inca lived in a mostly mountainous environment, which makes farming a little tricky. They developed some unique farming to agricultural techniques that allowed them to thrive. They utilized a technique called terrace farming. Now, terrace farming is carving the sides of hills and mountains into flat steps. You see from this picture that it is actually still used today. This increases the amount of flat uh, surface space and thereby increases the amount of area at the farm. One last thing to discuss with the Inca was this thing called quipus. Now, a fascinating aspect of Incan culture is that for all of their impressive accomplishments, they never developed a writing system. So that leads to the question of how a government that tightly controlled its people could keep track of everything. They used this thing. Okay, The quipus were a series of knotted strings. Now, it might look kind of like a hippie necklace, but it was actually used for record keeping. Now, I honestly do not know how they did this, but the Inca would assign different values to the different strings and knots that you see here on the picture. And they would use it for math and keeping track of things. Again, don't ask me how it works, but it did. All right, so that will wrap things up for the Inca. And then in the next video, we are going to very quickly discuss uh, some of the cultures and societies in North America.